How did you all almost let me get away with three consecutive Yu-Gi-Oh! videos in one year? Nah, 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 nah. I gotta fix this. I think it's about time I go back to my roots. And the game, the game award for best action game goes to... All right, pause. Let's rewind a bit to the 2017 Game Awards. Then President of Nintendo America, Reggie fils has just arrived on stage for the reveal of a port for the first two Bayonetta games for the Nintendo Switch. But it's not just that. He has one more thing in store. A teaser trailer for Bayonetta 3, which was now in development. And speaking as someone that watched this unfold as it happened, trust me when yes! I say fans lost their minds. <laughs> a new Bayonetta game? Shit, I gotta buy a Switch now! The teaser was similar to the ones done for the past two games, with the Umbran Witch fighting some unknown enemy in a dark room, but with one significant difference. It ended by implying that Bayonetta would die. Oh my god, what's gonna happen in this new Bayonetta game? I can't wait to see more! Then we were left to wait. And wait. And wait. As the years went on, the more concerning it felt that we had heard no news about Bayo 3 after its initial reveal. Loading up every new Nintendo Direct thinking, alright, this'll be the one with a Bayo 3 trailer. Continually, all we got out of Platinum Games during interviews was the standard, all is good in Bayonetta 3's development, don't worry about it, the game will come out when it's ready, no matter how many comically timed sticks of dynamite I sent to Kamiya's office. But after nearly five years of anticipation, Bayonetta 3 was finally released on October 28th, 2022. So the question we're now obviously faced with is, was it worth the wait? Well, that's a surprisingly loaded question. The game does indeed have all the over-the-top climax action the series is known for, along with some refreshing new additions. Bayonetta's still doing her thing, using weapons to violently tear apart unearthly creatures in a classy yet visceral fashion. But there's also some complicated feelings mixed in there too, namely with how it handled its characters, both new and old. While it may have earned high praise and even won awards for its gameplay, it's also hard to argue that it lived up to its own legacy. But rather than coyly dance around the issues, why don't we just get right into it? We've waited long enough, let's take a look at this complicated climax. Bayonetta. Alright, so the core premise for Bayonetta's third game is somehow even more convoluted and esoteric than the first two entries. From the top, we open on the Bayonetta from the first game in a life and death struggle against a new shadowy antagonist, and unfortunately, she's on the losing side of it. In terms of a prologue for a game, this is a strong opener, as it immediately grabs your attention. In all the adventures she's been on, we've never seen Bayonetta in a losing position like this before. So instantly we know how grim the situation is. And as we watch our protagonist tragically shatter into pieces, our new series character Viola is sent off on a mission. Jump to another universe and find a Bayonetta that can stop this threat. That's right, it's a multiverse story, because bouncing around the timeline wasn't already confusing enough. And so, Bayonetta is tasked with collecting the five Chaos Gears throughout the various multiverses in hopes of stopping this new villain from destroying their reality. But we'll save the story critiques for later. As always, Bayonetta's narrative is mostly just the preamble for what people actually paid for, the combat. So how was that handled? When it comes to action games like Bayonetta or DMC, the question with sequels is always, what did they change? Players invest hundreds of hours diving into all the tiny nuances and complexities of the combat for games that they love, so they instantly notice when something doesn't feel right. So between Bayonetta 1 and 2, the gameplay changes were extremely subtle on its face and wouldn't likely be noticed by a casual audience. Aside from Umbran Climax and a collection of new weapons, the changes mostly amounted to fiddling with the technicalities within the combat itself that you'd only notice if you've put the time to understanding all the intricacies of their systems. In contrast, Bayonetta 3 drastically revamps the combat that the series is known for. 
and it might be my favorite in the entire franchise. And hey, what's that doing there? Off the bat, one of the most notable changes in 3 is the appendage-based weapon setup. In past games, something that made Bayonetta stand out within the larger action game genre is that weapons were attached to both her hands and feet separately, which gave the player a lot of control on how they wanted to approach combat. You could pair a whip with a bow, sword with ice skates, or my personal favorite, big hammer and chain chomp. But 3 did away with all that. Instead, you have two weapon slots that you can swap between, and whatever is currently equipped is used for both your hand and foot attacks taking the series in the bold direction of DMC3 on the PS2. When this was first announced during the pre-release hype window, I can definitely say I was wary of this decision. While it didn't define the combat per se, having appendage-based weapon sets was part of Bayonetta's specific brand of bondage-based fighting styles, so it's odd that the designers were scrapping it entirely. However, to their credit, this seemingly was done for a reason. But before we get too deep into it, let's start with the smallest changes to the combat direction before working our way up to the glaringly obvious ones. Beginning with how Bayonetta even gets her weapons. In the previous two games, Bayonetta's arsenal was all found as collectibles throughout the levels by piecing together angelic LPs that Rodan would then use to attract demons, which he would then craft into weapons, which fit with Bayonetta's arcade game influence. Bayonetta 3 instead went for the direct approach, making her weapons more involved with the story being told. Aside from a couple of secret unlocks, weapons are bestowed on Bayonetta by other characters, usually a variant of herself from another universe that she encounters. It's subtle, but this makes Bayonetta's weapons feel more entwined with the game's world in a way that I appreciate. Also, not having to look up guides on where to find the record pieces is definitely a relief in its own right especially with how many weapons there are in this game. Not counting the alternate versions of her handguns, we're given a staggering 12 weapons to work with, and they definitely worked hard to get to that number two with some of these weapon designs. Flame yo-yos, an anchor, the gates to the mythological prison of the Greek Titans, though I think Platinum might be getting a call from Capcom sometime soon. With all those eyes, I think you'd be a bit more perceptive. Along with the size of the collection, there's also the sheer amount of options each weapon opens up, which can reach insane levels of player expression when it's all put together. All the weapons share the same inputs for combos and similar types of attacks, which on its face might feel like palette swaps of the same moveset, but like past Bayonetta games, it's in the particulars that show how each stands out. For one weapon, an input might be an aggressive rushdown attack, while another has Bayonetta climb on top of an inflated electrical bat and roll around on it like it's the circus. Both are functionally about Bayonetta quickly moving forward to start their attack, but are noticeably different in execution and implementation, which is where you find what weapons you like over the ones that you prefer to keep in the toolbox. I've put dozens of hours into this game, and I'm still discovering new ways to use each weapon and the interplay between them which is the most satisfying feeling you can get from a game like this. However, if I were to have one gripe about how 3 handled its weapon roster, it would be how you unlock those techniques. In prior games, if you bought Stiletto, for example, it was purchased for every weapon, no matter how different its effects were. In Bayo 3, though, weapons now have their own skill trees to unlock, which would be fine in theory. I'm sure the designer's intention was to have the experience of other action games, where unlocking a new weapon also comes with a new set of skills to purchase, giving you something to spend your currency on as you gradually expand your moveset along with understanding what each weapon can do. But since every weapon in Bayo 3 has the same skill tree for the same exact inputs, it's hard to shake the feeling that you're going through the same tedious process 12 times solely for the sake of it. Then along with the new selection of weapons, there's the associated demons that also have been given a larger spotlight and this is where the change to weapon switching starts to really make sense. For a start, Bayonetta's old Beast and Crow Within forms have been replaced, with every weapon now having their own dedicated Demon Masquerade, allowing Bayonetta to transform into a humanoid representation of the associated demon, because Mari Shimizaki hasn't already made enough killer Bayonetta designs for us. Now you have a Bayonetta for every possible occasion. Spider Bayo, Frog Bayo, Bird Bayo, Puppet Bayo, Train Bayo, Bisected Bat Bayo. 
Though this wasn't solely a cosmetic change. This time around, Bayonetta 3 puts a significant focus on traversal. Or at least that seemed to be the intention. That's because initially, the level design of Bayonetta 3 was planned to be semi-open world, where you land on the island of Thule early on, and that acts as your hub world to explore as you jump to different universes and various areas open up. This is likely why each demon masquerade has its own distinct function, like running across lava or access to triple jump, as that would be how you'd access new areas as you progress through the game. Midway into development though, the devs realized they had trouble pacing the game around this open world type of design, along with the Switch dev kits bursting into flames trying to render it all. So it was scaled back to the chapter based design of the past Bayonetta titles. But you don't exactly have to look hard to find the vestiges of this pseudo open world design still littered throughout the game. There's a noticeable emphasis on exploration and platforming challenges that the masquerade transformations are clearly meant to facilitate. Each level is covered in Niflheim gates, treasures, and unlocks sprinkled throughout to find, some of which require specific types of mobility to access. And on top of that standard level design fluff, every chapter also has a bonus level to unlock once you catch all the Umbran familiars hidden across the map, some of which give access to new weapons and accessories, meaning there's now a genuine purpose to chasing after them. Also, while we're on the topic of masquerades, it's worth mentioning how it was used to replace Umbran Climax. In Bayonetta 2, the biggest change to the core gameplay loop was Umbran Climax, a trigger state that changes all standard attacks into Wicked Weaves, and what would normally be a Wicked Weave at the end of a combo is upgraded to an Infernal Weave for extra damage. This was added as a way to give players access to a powered up form to either get them out of trouble or allow them to punish vulnerable enemies. But without a need for Umbran Climax anymore, Bayo 3 supplemented it with Masquerade Rage, which effectively cuts to the chase by doing a climactic AoE fighting game super after you've built up enough meter. It's not exactly adding a noticeable amount of depth to the game's combat, and mostly comes off like the designers wanted to add in something extravagant for the players to build up towards throughout their fights. Nothing like beating a boss by starting a spur of the moment mosh pit. But going back a moment, why did they remove the need for Umbran Climax? It was so famously beloved by the fanbase. Well, that ultimately brings me to the most significant change to the series so far. Well, I'd be damned if it ain't the Demon Slave. That's one ancient art I thought was lost for good. When it was first announced that the lead director of the next Bayonetta game was going to be Yusuke Miyata, best known for working on the game design of Wonderful 101 and Astral Chain, I wasn't entirely sure what to expect. Then I saw a trailer showing Bayonetta voguing to take control of a giant demon summon, and went, ah, okay, that checks out. I don't think it's an understatement to say that the Demon Slave mechanic represents a major shift in priorities with Bayonetta's combat, because now you're comboing for two. The devs might have taken away your ability to have two weapons attached at a time, but they replaced it by giving you a closet full of demon summons to choose from, each with their own specific abilities and attack list. Being able to swap between three demon summons at a time, the player is given a lot of versatility with how they want to incorporate them into their styling. They can act as dedicated launchers to start combos, big finishers to end combos, you can even use them as a parry. Learning from their past foray into summon-based action games, the biggest improvement Bayo 3 brings over Astral Chain is setting the demons to the directional inputs, meaning you never have to slow down to swap between summons. Being able to freely switch demons mid-combo does so much to make the combat flow well, since you never have to stop to change over, leading to insane openings for different demon attack combinations. You can freeze an enemy with Labalos's Ice Breath, rising uppercut with Madama Butterfly, then swap into a mid-air grab with Malphus to then slam them back down. And that's just off the top of my head writing this. With the introduction of the Demon Slave mechanic, the core gameplay experience moved from comboing as Bayonetta while avoiding taking hits yourself, to now also managing your summons. Not just the magic gauge that keeps them active, or the fact that Bayonetta is left vulnerable while crumping directions to them, but that allowing your demon to take too much damage can kill them putting that demon on a temporary cooldown. Worst case scenario though, your demons don't die, but instead get pissed off at how many hits you've let them take and go into a blind rage, attacking anything in sight, Bayonetta included. 
This is the most disruptive thing that can happen during a fight in this game, because your Witch Time will not trigger from an Infernal Demon attack, since it's considered an extension of Bayonetta herself. So if one of your summons goes into a rage, your main objective has suddenly changed to survive. While there are ways to use this to your advantage if you're clever, the rage meter is essentially meant to keep you from being over-reliant on a single summon to do everything. And also a good reminder that demons are living things too. Treat them right. However, a common complaint about bo 3s summoning mechanic is that despite all the systems intended to balance them, the demons are still too easy to abuse in fights. It turns out giving the player the ability to call in their older sibling to protect them makes it pretty easy to cheese encounters by summoning a demon and letting them take the reins for you while Bayonetta sits back and acts as their backup dancer, only stopping on occasion to build the magic meter back up. Which is an understandable criticism, if that's where you stop with it. While having basically an entire secondary roster of living weapons is rad on its own, where the Infernal Demons truly shine is how they intersect with Bayonetta. Taking further inspiration from Astral Chain, there are nuances to the Demon Slave mechanic that the game doesn't initially lay out for you that takes a simple summoning system into a whole new tier of combo potential once you start experimenting. Since you can input two attacks for your demon to go through at a time, you can set up a combo with a lot of windup, then release the Slave Dance for them to continue on as you go wild as Bayonetta, rinse and repeat. Once you realize Bayonetta can combo off along with her summons, the combat cracks open like my soft child skull when I was learning to skateboard. As soon as I learned this is how Infernal Demons worked, I ended up spending hours just labbing stuff in the training room to see what I could do because the amount of potential there was between Bayonetta's 12 weapons and 12 summons was astounding. That's why Infernal Demons are at their best when they aren't being used as a replacement for Bayonetta's combos, but as an enhancement. This is how you get tech like Flash Slave Offset. Combining Dodge Offset, the legacy mechanic that allows you to dodge mid-combo string without dropping it, and slipping a Demon Slave attack into the movement. My ancient 30-year-old hands can't do anything that impressive with the controls, but watching style players slowly piece together how to incorporate weapon skills with demon summoning into these crazy complex combos shows how much untapped potential Bayo3's gameplay represents. Though that isn't to say that the demon slave system is perfect. Far from it. Because of the size of the summons, there needs to be a constant shift in the camera's perspective to try to have Bayonetta and her demon share the same screen space resulting in the player regularly having to wrangle the camera like a misbehaving child, which isn't helped when demon attacks also blow a bunch of glitter in your eyes at the same time. So sometimes you'll get hit by something just because you couldn't see what's going on. Also, because demon slaves are the hot new mechanic, the game goes out of its way to push you into using it over anything else. Whether that's damage sponge bosses that practically demand them, enemies that make it impossible to be hit by Bayonetta herself, or the fact that Bayonetta's attacks feel just a bit weaker than they did in past games. In a genre built around player expression, as good as having more options are, it can be frustrating to be told you have to use certain mechanics to progress. Or, God forbid, a sequence where you're playing as the Infernal Demons themselves. Bayonetta is a game known for quick and snappy combat with a tight, responsive game feel, so I have no idea whose decision it was to have the player control a slow, lumbering kaiju multiple times. This isn't anything entirely new with Platinum Games, though. Somewhere in the founding documents of the studio, there's an internal decree that any game that Hideki Kamiya remotely touches needs to incorporate some arcade minigame into the design. So that's how the demon summons were brought into set pieces. And these can range anywhere from a quaint interlude between combat sections to, oh my god, who designed this? For every ball opera rhythm game, there's a stilted Malphus boss fight that overstays its welcome. So yeah, as great as the additions to Bayonetta's combat are for their added depth and unique playstyle, it's also not without its share of problems. And get used to that being a recurring thread. Speaking of, now would be a good time to talk about the new roster of enemies. Definitely not a regular. 
With Bayonetta 1, we were fighting angels. In Bayonetta 2, demons were introduced. And now with 3, we get the homunculi, mass-produced bioweapons used by the new Big Bad Singularity, with the intent of wiping out and combining the multiverse. Now, conceptually, I dig what they're going for with the homunculi. Angels and demons are transcendental beings beyond human comprehension, representing Paradiso and Inferno, respectively. But what about something man-made? So we get these sickly looking synthetic creations made up of hundreds of wriggling bodies until it's forced into a cohesive structure. There's an interesting contrast between their unnatural nature and having titles that reflect their intentions as mass produced soldiers meant for invasions. Even the enemy logs list their lifespans as service life, as their only value is how long they can work as soldiers. Credit where it's due, the enemy designers did put in the work to make it clear how the homunculi uniquely contrast the angels and demons from Bayonetta's past adventures. Though I bring all this up as a preemptive cushion for the next statement. The homunculi are easily the worst of the three enemy factions in Bayonetta. And this isn't just because it has the highest number of frustrating enemies to fight. Sure, the Murris makes me want to send some constructive feedback to the combat designers, but let's not pretend that Gracious and Glorious or Sloth were ever fun to run into in past games. This franchise is littered with enemies that are more annoying than challenging to fight. But there's something particularly lacking with the homunculi that frustrates me. Let's compare Valiants versus Cumulo Nimbus as an example. Fundamentally, they represent the same type of challenge. A large enemy that looms over you, doing sweeping moves and dropping explosives around them pushing the player to find an in through all the swipes and lasers in order to attack them. These are the types of enemies that test every one of the skills you've learned throughout the game. If you haven't gotten a grasp of situational awareness yet, you're gonna get grabbed. Now, this is where I say that the Valiance is one of my personal favorite angels in the series. The face being part of the sword handle is a clever design touch, the way Bayo kills the first one you fight in two is distinctly memorable. Even its silhouette is immediately recognizable because of how it stands out among the other angels. By comparison, the Cumulo Nimbus is... a big blob? It first appears in the prologue as training fodder for the Demon Slave mechanic, and from there it's just... sort of around. And that right there is the problem. There's a distinct lack of personality with the homunculi. Part of what made Bayonetta so unique is the dynamic of taking these prideful, celestial beings and utterly humiliating them through BDSM. Seeing the confidence of angelic and demonic monsters shatter in the face of this witch overpowering them. However, since the homunculi are designed to be soulless, faceless weapons made for war, you don't get that contrast. The climax finishers are as over-the-top bombastic as they've always been, but there aren't any strong reactions from the enemies, like when the beloved desperately tries to escape being devoured in one. The homunculi just blandly take the damage until they finally blow up into bits of goo. The most personality we get out of the homunculi is when they possess a group of soldiers and do the thriller. But outside of that, they're just... there. They're punching bags to beat up. And one of them is literally designed to be a speed bag, yet somehow they never take advantage of it. None of this is helped either by the change to the torture attack system, which went from a special QT button mash that has been at a slowly crushing an enemy under her heel in a humiliating way at the expense of a full bar of magic, to a quick, simple two-button finisher on a stunned enemy that doesn't have any cost. In terms of the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay, this does make torture moves flow into the combat better, especially since you can trigger multiple at once after a big summon attack but a certain charm of Bayonetta is lost in the process that makes it far less impactful. It might be a small detail in the grand scheme of things, but the personal involvement in the enemy's fatal bondage experience is what made torture attacks feel so satisfying to do, even if it ultimately was a button-mashing detour in combat. Now, it's simply a hand wave that Bayonetta does in their general direction that doesn't feel remarkably special. I'm not going to remember any of these attacks like I do taking a chainsaw to the harmony or putting the joy onto a wooden horse. 
So whether it's torture attacks being relegated to bonus damage or the general lack of personal charm, the homunculi fights always left me wanting in a major way despite how much I enjoyed the core combat itself. It's not a good sign for the new enemies that I got more excited running into verses with classic angels and demons to fight over any of the homunculi. Looks like they don't care much for your techniques. Why don't I try a more attentive approach? And since we're already knee deep into the divisive aspects of this game, we might as well get to the other substantial change Bayonetta 3 brought with it. How about you tell us who you are first? Miss Viola. If I had to define Viola in a single word, it would be unrefined. Though to the dev's credit, that was at least partially by design. Many have pointed out how Viola is the Nero to Bayonetta's Dante, and it's a pretty easy comparison to see. A young, spunky new main character that's introduced to take up the mantle from the original protagonist, with an arc focused on discovering who they are as they rise up to the hero's level. At least that's what it feels like it's supposed to be. We'll put a pin in that for now. Now, personally, I'm a fan of Viola. Trying to design a new character that could stand on par with Bayonetta without it potentially coming off as trying too hard was always going to be a gargantuan task. So their solution was pretty clever. You see, Bayonetta is this effortlessly cool woman who's always in control of the situation. So what if the new character wasn't that? Rather than designing a character that has to compete with how badass Bayonetta is, the designers went in the complete opposite direction and made Viola into a tryhard dork. Hey! And I love it. From the punk aesthetic to the general rowdy attitude, everything about Viola projects this feeling of an immature teenager trying their hardest to come off as a hardcore rebel, but struggling to keep all the spaghetti in their pockets. Once she gets the ability to hover, it comes with all this shaky confidence of a learner driver getting behind the wheel of a car for the first time. Even her main battle theme radiates this mid-2000s fuck you mom, it's not a phase energy that fits her vibe perfectly. Looking at her design for the first time, you might get the impression that no one at Platinum has ever seen a punk before, but going with the intention that she's the new, inexperienced Umbran Witch coming up under Bayo that's struggling to be taken seriously, they nailed her design for getting that across. Oh, just great. Ugh. Glad Bayonetta wasn't here to see that. Narratively, it's easy to compare to Nero, though in gameplay, Viola's actually a lot closer to Trish in DMC4 Special Edition, using a mixture of sword combos and punches when the sword is otherwise occupied. Going from Bayonetta's elegant flair, Viola's playstyle is more scrappy, emphasizing big dramatic charge attacks interspersed with snappy melee hits. It's like that clumsy scene kid you knew in high school actually was studying the blade. But the biggest difference to Bayonetta is how Viola taps into Witch Time, the universal fuck off button known as the parry. While her approach to combos isn't remarkably different from Bayonetta, using all the same combo buttons and motion inputs for attacks, her defensive options require a shift in focus since it demands taking attacks head on rather than moving out of the way. Like they turned the Moon of Mahakala accessory from past games into an entire character. And in the same way that Witch Time lasts longer, the closer to frame perfect Bayo dodges an attack, a perfect last second parry as Viola means a longer time to punish, thus rewarding being able to read enemy patterns. And that's honestly all I might have had to say about it. It's an alright parry, it does parry things, knocking back attacking enemies as if you went way over guessing their age. That is until recently, as in midway through working on this video, when Platinum unexpectedly dropped a patch that vastly improved the feel of Viola's parry. Prior to the patch, her one defensive option felt clunky, since the window for a perfect parry was uncomfortably narrow. So you'd often just block the attack, temporarily stunning the enemy with a second long winch time that deactivated before you could even take advantage of it. It made Viola feel stiff for what her combat should be going for. After the patch though, her parry window was expanded to allow for a bit more leniency while polishing up the activation time so that witch time lasts longer. 
There was even a fix that allowed Viola to parry while she charged up an attack without completely losing the charge, meaning there was now proper incentive to use that mechanic in combos without worrying you'd lose it if an enemy attacked. Plus, it has the added benefit that this can be a good starting point for new players to learn how to use dodge offsets in combat, since it's fundamentally the same type of input. But as a counterbalance to these buffs, there was a system added in that shortened the length of witch time if you are repeatedly spamming the block input, acting like a slap on the wrist for not parrying with confidence. Doing a parry isn't cool if it's just someone mashing the block button until someone walks into it. Now, these changes might sound like subtle little improvements, especially when looking at gameplay footage where it's hard to see the difference but it goes a long way to make her feel better to control. On top of the fact that any Viola and Niflheim challenges that were witch time focused were death to actually beat before these updates. Then there's the last notable mechanic Viola has, which is her own infernal demon in the form of her funny little familiar, Cheshire. <laughs> I like Cheshire. Functionally, they work like Bayonetta's demons, both for combo finishers and as a summon, but due to her inexperience, Viola can control her demon support in the same way Bayo can, so Cheshire will just act of their own volition while summoned, only attacking within a certain radius surrounding their sword. The trade-off is that since Viola doesn't have to maintain a dance to keep her summon active, she's able to move and attack herself, so Cheshire is less a tag-in and more of an assist. Though even with this difference, Viola's actually more vulnerable by comparison since there's no way to direct Cheshire to play defense and the sword being the summoning medium means Viola loses her main form of protection, i.e. her parry. Rather than something that can be heavily abused like the other infernal demons, Cheshire goes in the opposite direction where it's something to be used with careful consideration, mostly when you want to punish vulnerable enemies or larger bosses. Between the charm of her lovably cringe personality and feisty playstyle, Viola feels like a character designed for me to adore. So why do I prefer playing as Bayonetta? Well, there's a few reasons. Firstly, you can tell the game itself was designed with Bayo in mind, not Viola. There are a number of enemies and secret missions where you can feel that Viola doesn't have the right tools to deal with them. As if she was an afterthought tossed in partway through the game's development that then has to work into another character's game design. Viola has such a short range to her attacks that large flying bosses or anything that has to be dealt from a distance through summons just feel actively worse to fight. As much as I like Cheshire, for a game designed with summoning demons as a prominent design focus in combat, putting in a character with no control over their familiar might not have been the best decision. Now, one could make the argument that this helps demonstrate the gulf of difference between her and Bayonetta in terms of their capabilities, but that leads me to another major issue with Viola that I'd like to present in the form of a question. Game designers, when you make a new playable character for your action games, why are you scared to give them an expanding toolkit like the main protagonist? Nero in DMC4, V in DMC5, and now Viola. There seems to be this trend that when a long-running series known for its stylish combat and catalog of weapons needs to design a new character for its players to use, the solution is to give them one unique mechanic and then little beyond that. All these characters have the same dilemma where their entire moveset can be purchased as soon as you start playing them, while their older counterparts continue to develop their toolkits as you progress through the game, further enticing you to keep playing to see what else you get. Half the fun of these games is discovering a variety of new weapons and seeing what you can do with them. Again, you can say this is an easy way to use gameplay mechanics as a demonstration of how inferior the new character is to the original protagonist. The former is fresh out of style university that barely knows how to hold a sword, while the other is a tenured professor with this wide array of tools at their disposal. But after a certain amount of time, it does start to get frustrating being relegated to play a lesser character that isn't catching up. 
Like, why not give Viola a set of spiked gauntlets or magic army boots to expand on her specific flavor of melee combat? The only thing that does unlock for Viola as you play through the campaign is the fairy trigger transformation she awakens during her journey chasing after Luca through the multiverse. Which, I'll be frank, I don't have a ton to say about. It's an auto win button that lets her spam through a fight. Bayonetta had Masquerade Rage, so they need to give Viola some equivalent. There's not a ton of depth to it. Now, don't get me wrong, I don't want to look at a developer attempting to experiment with expanding on their game's design and go, why'd you even bother with this? Because it's good to try new ideas. And minor issues aside, there's a fun character to play in Viola. I just wish they spent more time fleshing out her unique playstyle. Recently, a YouTuber by the name of Psycho put out a series of moveset showcases for Bayonetta 3, going over each character's roster of combos and attacks. And while Bayonetta took a collective two hours between her weapons and demons, Viola's took under 10 minutes. When it's all laid out like that, it's hard not to feel like she got the short end of the design document, no matter how many post-launch buffs they give her. Viola, that's coming out of your cut for this one. Honestly, Viola being as half-baked as she is wouldn't be as much of an issue, considering she only has four levels to herself, if it wasn't for what the story attempts to do with her. And I guess now is as good a time as any to rip that band-aid off. Will forever be in my heart. Now, assuming you're not terminally online to have seen all the discourse surrounding Bayo 3's release when everyone first played it, it's worth noting how the finale of the game has left fans quite split. Either you enjoyed the ending for what it was, and felt it was a fine setup for future games to explore, or it left you feeling a burning contempt for the five years you spent waiting for this spit in the face, and would rather pretend that Bayonetta 3 didn't even have an ending. I'd say I'm closer to the latter side. And just to get it out front, writing has never been platinum strength. At their best, Platinum Stories have the vibe of a Saturday morning cartoon from the 90s, and every game they've done that has quality writing was done by a third party. However, there's an important distinction between writing that prioritizes fun spectacle over a deeper narrative, and writing that actively brings down the franchise in an attempt to do something more. But to make sure we're on the same page, let's rapid fire through the last act of the game before I start picking away at it like a vulture looking for that last morsel of a corpse. <clears throat> so after Bayonetta has collected the five MacGuffins across the multiverse, she meets up with Jean, who was sent to fetch Dr. Sigurd after a series of stealth minigames. Apparently, someone at Platinum got really into gunpoint during development. Dr. Sigurd was someone Viola fought alongside with in her original universe, and is a renowned researcher of multiverse technology, being the only one with the knowledge to open the door to the Alphaverse with the Chaos Gears so that Bayonetta can stop Singularity's plans to merge the multiverse. After a brief scuffle with more homunculi soldiers, they're able to get Bayonetta through to the Alphaverse. Once there, Madama Butterfly and her have a quick tussle with the homunculi fortress, before running into Luca in his strider form that we've continually encountered throughout the game. Seeing her bumbling friend struggling to keep it together, Bayonetta attempts to calm him down, but he responds by getting up in her guts. Oh, that's awful, I need to rewrite that. After this soft approach fails, Bayonetta attempts to beat Luke out of it, all the while as he laments how a mysterious inner voice has always led him toward the truth, and that despite all the bravado he puts on, he's a nobody loser who's slowly being turned into a hateful monster. We'll come back to that. After Luca and the dark spirit inhabiting him are defeated, Viola floats in with Luca on, the Fairy King variant of Luca whom she had encountered on her own journey. I have no idea when fairies were introduced into this franchise, this literally comes out of nowhere, but we're just gonna roll with it. It's also implied that the Fae are the power Viola and Luca are tapping into when they go into their respective transformations. Speaking of, when Luca on and Viola were dragged into the Alphaverse due to the whims of the script, they were able to pick up a falling Luca on their way in. But oh no, Sigurd was actually controlled by Singularity the entire time, and they plan to trap Bayonetta in the Alphaverse after icing Jean. What'll we do? 
It's all right though, Luca gets to have his one cool hero moment, choosing to sacrifice himself to stabilize the Vortex in order to get Bayonetta and Viola back home from the Alphaverse, with Bayonetta waking up in Manhattan. Upon finding Sigurd's singularity, he takes on the form of a giant kaiju, so Bayonetta in turn summon one of her own. And oh god, it's another Sin Gamora fight, do we really need to do this again? Once that's taken care of, Bayonetta summons Madama Butterfly for a bit of extra backup, who Kamayamama's singularity into the Mesosphere so we can have our mandated Platinum Space Battle. On the side of the corpse of their last form, we have the next singularity boss fight, ending with Bayonetta knocking the previous universe's Bayonettas out of them, along with the PNG Netta Battalion as reinforcements. And oh yeah, Jean's back! Oh, no. No, she's not. From there, we segue into another boss fight with Singularity back in Manhattan, this time one that mirrors the opening fight from the prologue, along with another tiresome Gamora fight. But after a while, Bayonetta yet again falters. No need to worry though, Viola's here to save the day. <sighs> Alright, take a lap, we'll try again later. Things are starting to look bad, both our heroines are in dire straits, when at the last minute... So it's here that the Pepe Silvia wheels start going into overdrive, as the Bayonettas from the first and second games come in for around themselves, giving us the message, only you can save yourself. Also the use of the UI and music from the first game in this fight is a cute detail, I appreciate that. It's still not enough though, as Singularity is able to send them flying too. Okay, the last time was the fake out. Now, this time, it's Viola's turn in the spotlight. Her music's blaring, she can finally protect her mom after losing her at the start of the journey. We can bring her story full cir- <laughs> just kidding, get wrecked, loser. All right, Viola isn't gonna be any help. But what about three bayonettas in a trench coat? Did they combine? Well, after a three-way beatdown, we're almost there. And look, Viola actually got a hit in right before getting snatched up by Singularity again. Cue Luca crashing in to save the day. Or, are you gonna answer that? No? Okay. After a bit of romantic banter and the final confirmation that Viola is indeed Bayonetta and Luca's child from another universe, we get boss fight number six, and that proves to be the clincher. However, it turns out Singularity's a sore loser, as they choose to blow themselves up and consume everyone with them. In the blowback, Viola's knocked unconscious, and Bayonetta loses her control of Gamora, leading to yet another attempt on the witch's life. As a quick tangent, how is Gamora still on the demon payroll after trying to kill Bayonetta multiple times already? You think after assassination attempt number two on the boss, there would at least be a suspension of some kind? Anyway, this leads to Strider Luca having to make a decision. Save Viola from being consumed by the Vortex Singularity created, or save Bayonetta from Gamora. Ultimately, he chooses the former, leading to Bayonetta having her soul torn from her body. After he saved his daughter and cut down the rampaging demon, Luca embraces a dying Bayonetta, as the two of them confess their love for each other before being dragged down to Inferno, all while Viola expresses my sentiments exactly. End credits. All right, stop right there. You aren't gonna girl boss dance your way out of this one. Okay, so where do we start with all this? Well, to cut some of you off at the pass, my issues with the ending have little to do with Bayonetta not getting together with Jean in the end, even if that's the relationship they've spent far more time developing over the last three games. Look, I'm a mediocre straight man myself, so if anything, Luca represents the dream. I too hope I can romance a bad bitch way out of my league by being a goofy little guy. However, it's like the famous saying goes, it's not about the destination, it's about how you get there. And the way Bayonetta 3 gets there is in a rust out jalopy that's missing a tire. In fact, what bothers me most is there is an ending on par with Bayonetta 1 or Wonderful 101 deep down here. 
There are multiple exciting moments littered throughout that could have knocked it out of the park if done right. But they so utterly failed in the execution that it sours the milk. This feels like the first draft of a script before the writer goes back to tighten it up and fix any mistakes they missed, not the final version ready for publication. But to get the glaring issue out of the way first, the romance. Now, honestly, the idea that any relationship defines Bayonetta is weird itself because I don't think she needs anyone. I've never looked at her styling on godly beings and thought, hmm, but who does she go to brunch with? Though that isn't to say you couldn't make a romance with her work. As I implied earlier, there's an entire cottage industry based on fans speculating what Bayonetta and John's love life is like when they aren't fighting angels. Yet the romantic relationship the writers chose to push for Bayonetta was the character who's best described as the embodiment of the spilt nuggies meme. Oh, shit! But hey, they've had their occasional flirty banter, so I could possibly see them getting together eventually. Except no, not only are Bayonetta and Luca a romantic pairing that have always loved each other, it's a cosmically ordained romance that transcends across the multiverse, the Arch Adam and Eve. Fate brought us here together, and it will never tear us apart. Because Luca was planned as the ending romance for this game, all this grandiose importance has to be put onto him in order to justify it. Remember I said it was clever that they avoided making Viola someone that is instantly on Bayonetta's level because it runs the danger of feeling forced? That's literally what they did with Luca. Luca went from a little goober who's always trailing behind Bayo throughout her adventures, and suddenly jumped to becoming a badass werewolf who can fight on par with her, and is strong enough to one-shot infernal demons like it's nothing. Like, where did this suddenly come from? And the writers seem to know the problem with this, which is why they attempt to give Luca all this extra depth in his last boss fight, because they realized they hadn't developed him despite being the crux of the finale. And this all could have been an interesting direction to take Luca's character, exploring his rationale for adventuring and why he puts on this persona for people, if it didn't reek of hastily tacked on development for a gag character with no real meaning other than to justify pairing him with Bayonetta in the final hour of the game. But what really bugs me most about this romance isn't specifically about Luca as a character, it's what it does to Bayonetta's. Because the idea that Bayonetta, of all characters, needs a man to save her in the end is so incredibly lame. She doesn't die to save someone else. She isn't making a noble sacrifice. There's no active decision on her part. Because Luca chose to save Viola and thus wasn't able to protect her, she dies. Bayonetta's death has nothing to do with her character. It has to do with Luca's development as a love interest. And that spits in the face of why Bayonetta was so great in the first place. This moment robs her of all her agency solely so we can get a romantic death scene. Whoever in the writer's room proposed taking a character that was defined by their confidence and independence and killing them off for the sake of a romance storyline should have been launched into the sun like Jubileus. But Fox, some of you might be saying incredulously, that's not the Bayonetta and Luca you knew from past games, so it doesn't matter. And that's the other can of worms we gotta open. Going by the wording and context from this scene, it's implied that the Bayonetta we've been playing through 3 isn't actually the same one from the past two games, but in fact, an older version of the child Cereza from Bayonetta 1 after she was put back in her timeline. And this brings me to the larger issue, the multiverse problem. Now, I was already a bit apprehensive when Bayonetta 3 trailers hinted that we'd be jumping between alternate universes, because unless your name is Everything Everywhere All at Once, or Into the Spider-Verse, introducing a multiverse into your story is asking for needlessly messy complications, and I don't think Bayonetta needed any more help with that. And it's not as if Bayonetta 3 makes good use of the multiverse premise either. At their best, exploring the multiverse is a way to have characters see the multiple paths their lives could have gone down had they made different decisions. Exploring the philosophical and emotional weight behind our personal choices that make us unique in the infinite possibilities of existence. And at their worst, you get the comic book dilemma. 
where the multiverse is used as a commercial tool so that writers can work themselves out of corners they wrote into and publishers can hit the reset button if the current continuity isn't selling well. But in the case of Bayonetta 3, the multiverse is solely an excuse for a sightseeing expedition. You see, shoehorning a multiverse into your story is an easy way to artificially embiggen the scope of your narrative to trick your audience into thinking the stakes have suddenly been raised. But in reality, it doesn't really matter when you're only seeing one easily disposable universe at a time. The game could have easily been a witch world tour, a la Around the World in 80 Days, and very little of substance would have been lost. Bayo and Jean might be the last known Umbran witches, but we know from past accessory descriptions that there are other types of witches from various cultures in the past. Let's learn about them. Instead of hopping to different dimensions, make it so Bayonetta has to travel through time to stop Singularity from collecting the Chaos Gears hidden throughout the timeline. The universe numbers we see throughout the game whenever we land in a new locale are already coordinates for the locations they're set in. Just change the Bayonetta variants to different witches of the past from their respective cultures. It's not like Bayonetta seeing alternate versions of herself is used to explore her relationships or past experiences anyway. They're cute alternate costumes that exist solely to die and pass on their associate weapons before we jump to the next universe. Nothing is realistically gained from making this game a multiverse story other than tossing on the metric ton of narrative baggage that comes with opening that particular Pandora's box. That's why if the response to any criticisms of 3's handling of Bayonetta is, well, that's not the Bayonetta and Luca you knew, then my response is, why should I care then? Seriously, if every game I've played is yet another alternate storyline of Bayonetta that has to be placed somewhere on a graph and not a continuous narrative, why should we bother continuing to follow this character? If everything can be hand waved away as, oh that was another alternate timeline, why should anything matter? At this point, I don't even know what's considered the main timeline, or who the main character of the story is. Did the past two Bayonettas we played merge together with three Bayonetta, so now they all share a timeline? Were those also variants, and the past ones actually died when their universe was ripped out? I genuinely don't know. This is ultimately the main problem with framing your story within a multiverse of timelines, because as soon as it's used to indiscriminately erase any decision or a narrative choice that impacts the characters, because it's just another timeline and we can change it later if we want, you immediately remove any sense of stakes or investment in the story solely for a bit of fun spectacle. Then lastly, we should talk about Viola, because even the new girl couldn't get away from being done dirty here. For the entirety of the story, the theme of Viola's journey has been her bumbling loser antics as she keeps failing to have her moment as the hero, often needing others to come in and save her. Naturally, this feels like it's setting her up for a moment where she gets to be the one in control and save the day at the very end, much like another character in DMC5, thus putting a nice little bow on her arc, a simple and easy bit of growth for a new character. She goes from being a hot mess to being the best. And the final confrontation with Singularity feels like it's going that direction multiple times. Bayonetta's in desperate need, she's about to be defeated by the big bad, but not so fast because Viola's here. She's not gonna lose her mom again. Now's her chance to stop Singularity and prove herself once and for all. Except she's swatted away like it's nothing. Doesn't even get her own boss fight. <laughs> wow, consider my expectations averted. It's not like there aren't seeds to show Viola's development either. Partway into the game, she's given a Fey transformation after facing off against Strider Luca, and yet it never comes up again until the epilogue. The natural way to represent how she's changed since the prologue when she had to escape from her universe is having her tap into this new transformation to fight back against the one she lost to at the start. There are so many directions they could have taken this point of the story, but instead it feels like they gave up partway through. The pieces are all there, but they've been left lying on the floor so we can make room for Luca to save the day. I'm genuinely baffled how they entirely skipped over having a fight as Viola, but they gave us one with Bayonetta 1 as a fan nod, when they know they're going to end the game with Viola taking up the mantle as Bayonetta. This is the perfect chance to develop your new protagonist. 
And it's especially confusing when you consider the post-credit boss she gets with Dark Bayo. There's only one person allowed to call me that! Now, on paper, I'm not opposed to what they're trying to do with Viola here. If anything, a character intended to become the new main character, getting a chance to fight the original protagonist as proof they are capable themselves, is a great way to represent the passing of the torch in a way the players can experience themselves through gameplay. Since I'm sure the comparison to DMC5 is getting tired, let's go with Yakuza Like a Dragon as an example. As its entire storyline is building up Ichiban taking up the protagonist role from Kiryu, while proving how he is uniquely his own character. So it's exciting when we get a moment of the two facing off. A clash of personalities and playstyles that reflects how far the series has come. The problem with how Bayonetta 3 does it is that it hasn't been earned. Thematically, this boss fight is a signifier that Viola is finally on par with her mother and can handle things from here. But the narrative leading up to this moment consistently tells us the opposite. She can't handle things herself. She's in constant need of someone else to protect her. Some might say she's still dead weight. If they had planned for this outcome from the start, there should have been a gradual progression for Viola's character. Seeing her tiny victories that work towards her being recognized as a talented Umbran witch in her own right. But as far as what is presented, all we got was her fumbling through the story before she's given the title of Bayonetta because Cereza died. There isn't anything inherently wrong with wanting to make Viola a new face for the Bayonetta series. I think it's important for legacy IPs to diversify their character roster, and there is potential in exploring new protagonists having to live up to their predecessor. But if you want fans to be excited about that, you need to make them interested in what they can uniquely bring to the series, not present the equivalent of... Please clap. <laughs> And I know I'm getting heated about a series that isn't known for its strong or cohesive stories. I get that. I never expected 100 Years of Solitude or Vagabond from the third entry of the Bayonetta franchise. But what has always made Bayonetta such an amazing series is its characters. Since her first appearance, Bayonetta herself has stood out within video games as an iconic personality that had never been done before. A woman character that wasn't just sexualized, but was confident and even weaponized it? She was always in control in a playfully campy way that was mesmerizing to watch. There's simply no one like Bayonetta in this industry. So when you get an ending that feels like it takes a big steamer on that legacy, it makes you less trusting of how they're going to be handled going forward. And apparently, I'm not alone in these issues. Upon hearing the vocally critical response from fans, Hideki Kamiya tweeted, I don't think it was unexpected at all, but it seems the ending of Bayonetta 3 wasn't conveyed correctly to everyone. So I think Bayo 4 will be an unexpected development for everyone. After all, when Bayo 4 comes out, I'm sure there will be people who say, you added that as an afterthought. Bro, I hate to be the one to break it to you, but if it wasn't conveyed well, that's partially on you. You're one of the writers and directors. Kamiya's Twitter aside, I have no doubt that Cereza will be back in the next mainline game. They've already put out a trailer for a spin-off game focusing on Bayonetta's origins told through a storybook, something Bayo 3 teased in a secret unlock and will likely backfill a lot of lore regarding fairies and Cereza's history with Cheshire. But after seeing how 3 handled its characters, I can't say I'm excited about any future titles. So, I like to end these videos on a positive note, maybe some bigger takeaway, but man, I'm just bummed. Bayonetta 3 was something I had been looking forward to for years, so ending on such a bitter note is a hard pill to swallow. If I haven't hammered it home already, it feels like Bayonetta 3 was meant to be Platinum's response to DMC5, a love letter to a long-running franchise that acknowledges how far it's come while setting up plans for the future but it was handled with all the grace of a kaiju lumbering through Manhattan. For a game supposedly in development for over five years, Bandit 3 feels bizarrely unfinished. A number of ideas and concepts are interesting, but unpolished, as if the developers realized they had a due date looming and didn't have anything finalized yet, so they had to rush to get something together, resulting in a genuinely fun game riddled with problems that could have been fixed with better planning and foresight. I didn't mention it earlier, but the fact that Platinum felt they had to put out such an extensive balance patch for Viola speaks volumes, because coming from Platinum, that's unheard of. 
Not to be overdramatic, but overhaul patches like this are indicative of a development cycle that wasn't given the time it was needed, and not something you'd expect of the Platinum from 10 years ago. Going back to 2013, Platinum games were the indie darlings of the video game market. Bayonetta, Vanquish, Metal Gear Rising, Wonderful 101. These guys were untouchable in the action game genre. If anything, they were setting the new standard for what stylish action games could do. Even some of the work-for-hire licensed games they developed were still a cut above what other AAA studios were doing. That's why it's been sad seeing them struggle the last few years, as projects are cancelled on them or fail to manifest in any significant form. A company that used to define the cutting edge is now playing catch up with the worst fads of the last five years. This was seen most prevalently in the failure to launch known as Babylon's Fall, which was some bizarre attempt at either trend chasing or living out some public humiliation fetish on a grand scale. What's more is that despite seeing incredibly low sales numbers and even lower player counts with Babylon's Fall, Platinum is insistent that they will be back with more live service games in the future. While the Viola patch showed they can own up to and even rectify some mistakes during development, the Babylon's Fall debacle reveals a more pig-headed stubbornness that I fear could plague the studio going forward. But who knows, maybe this is just some midlife slump for the studio. Nobody bats a thousand their entire career. Lord knows I don't. If every series met its end at the hands of one less than stellar entry, we wouldn't have gotten Resident Evil 7, Metroid Dread, or even DMZ5. Hell, I remember back in the early 2010s when everyone and their mother was lamenting how far Capcom had fallen after a series of middling titles. Fittingly, around the same time Platinum was making a name for itself by developing its own distinct brand of over-the-top action titles. Similar to the Platinum we're starting to see today, the major reason Capcom struggled was that they were so preoccupied with chasing after trends that they lost sight of why fans loved their games in the first place. But now, Capcom has climbed back out from the pit of mediocrity to re-establish itself as a pioneer in the video game market after learning from those past mistakes with how their series were handled. And if anything, they're going stronger than ever. Companies naturally go through changes as the world around them evolves and developers come and go. It's a fact of life. And with this change, you can almost always expect some growing pains that come along with it. We all go through our awkward transitionary periods. People don't care how you exactly get from A to Z. What matters is that you don't lose sight of who you are at around T. That's why I hold out hope that the devs at Platinum still have their hearts in the right place, and they used the experience of the last five years to refocus and recenter their efforts into being the arbiters of quality and fun we all fell in love with years ago. But I guess only time can really tell. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.